Hi, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Hopkinton. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the show before, my name is Art Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, so our offices, we have offices in, in Worcester, um, Westboro, and Boston. This show, though, is not about <coughs> elder law. Uh, it's really about my friends Frank and Mary. If you've gone to any of my presentations that Amy Beck has been kind enough to allow me to do at the, at the Senior Center, mm -hmm. I always talk about Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and their goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And the goal of this show is to let you know the people and the pr programs that you may want to know or that Frank and Mary want to know about so that they can do just that. So Amy has was, been kind enough to co-host the show with me right. because she knows so many of the folks, like everybody in town, <laughs> that you really need to know. For this particular show, though, I've invited on a couple of people. They're actually people who are going to be part of the seminar that I'm going to be doing at the Senior Center on Tuesday, November the 12th at 10 AM. And it's about dealing with the last year of your life, dealing with the last year of your life. And I wanted to be talking about all of the issues that might come up if you kind of know that your life, while it's not, you know, going to, you know, going to end tomorrow, it's going to end at some time in the foreseeable future, not the unforeseeable future. So uh, we've invited two wonderful mm -hmm. guests. Um, my friend uh, Rebecca Wesley Wild uh, is a, um, what used to be called the geriatric care manager and is now called an aging life, life care, care professional, professional. professional, who deals uh, pretty much 100% pretty much with, with, with seniors and, and, right. and trying to figure out all of the things that they need. And as you know, and as we've talked before, I try to encourage clients to talk to somebody who is doing that as a professional matter, both so that they can kind of get a second set of eyes on their program so they're not just trying to have their kids figure it out, which is always a hassle, right? And because the programs, as you know, are like all over the place. Right. So it's the reason why people come to the Senior Center a lot. It's to say, I'm, I've got this problem. How do I, who do I start with, right? And then that's something good to remember, that the Senior Center has two outreach coordinators who can help you make decisions, that can give you some advice and point you in the right direction. And so, you know, don't hesitate to start with us and then we can pass you on to people like Rebecca. Yes, yes, and the Senior Center typically even has a person at the door who's willing to direct you That's to actually right. <laughs> help you try to figure this stuff That's out. That's right. So, um, Rebecca, we've talked about these issues before and, and we've had you know, clients that we've shared who have, have dealt with and are dealing with some of these issues. Sure. So the, the, the point of, of today, and, and we have a second guest, a wonderful doctor named uh, Anthony Wilson, who has specializes in palliative care issues, mm -hmm. is really to talk about Frank and Mary. So here's the hypothetical. So there's Frank and Mary, but now Frank has passed away, and Mary is just by herself. And, she's, and she hasn't been doing great. She's in her 90s. But now she she's, knows that at some point in the not-too-distant future, she may die. Right? Whether because she got that cancer diagnosis and she had doing the, been doing the chemo, but now she said, I'm not going there anymore. Or she's had heart problems or lung problems and she's had stents put in and things are just kind of, kind of not going south immediately, but right? right? Or there's the case where she's got dementia because of Alzheimer's or something else. Mm -hmm. And so she may, she may not know that her time is almost up, right? right. But somebody in her family knows. Right. Mm -hmm. So can you just kind of talk about those cases? Talk about and in, in, in assume that a person really has, has time to figure things out, right? right? right. Uh, wh what kinds of resources that should they be looking at? What kinds of conversations do you have with people? And Amy, I'm sure that you know, I'd like you to kind of chime in because this comes up, I'm sure, at the Senior Center. Mm -hmm. these, these are, it, we all face it. Absolutely. We all face it. Right? I know that in, in the presentation I'm doing, I'm noting that Mary at this point at, at age 90 has a life expectancy of about five years, right? So no matter what, you know, things are getting closer. So just kind of, can you just talk about this? Well, in the best case too, Mary has been an, a senior center attendee and he, she's known by the staff at the center and she's been able to take advantage of those services. But very likely by the time she's 90, if she's still living in that home, mm -hmm. whether or not the desire is to be buried in the backyard or not, it's very possible she can't live alone in that home. 
especially if she's starting to look at an end-of-life diagnosis, that if she's had a really good experience with her doctor, her doctor's been able to help her anticipate the fact that in her family that we're starting to look at a finite number of months, conceivably. Living alone at home is not probably going to be reasonable for her. Um, and even if she had no specific end-of-life diagnosis, it's getting to be more difficult for her. She really can't manage. And if she were to be a candidate to be receiving hospice care, which you would hope would happen after perhaps some palliative care, um, she really needs to have caregivers. She needs to have a team who's able to provide supportive services for her. Hospice can't provide it all. And we want to make sure that she has a team of caregivers, whether they're paid or whether it's a family member or an, an assembly of paid and family members who are available to be supportive for her kind of care. And sometimes that will be able to be people who help with medication management or to help her with bathing and dressing, those kinds of activities that require assistance. And I think at this time, one of the things we look at a lot, care managers try to make sure that the kinds of services are in place which allow the family to be able to be present and to not just be racing around grocery shopping and cleaning and doing all the work that's associated with caring for somebody who's frail and declining. And so when you say present, you mean present like present. to be with the person right. as not opposed just to present to do the errands right. and to right. cut the lawn and to do all of right. this other all right. this other jazz. Exactly. And I think you know, again, when we have an idea that life is limited, um, I, I know we always try to encourage people, you know, this is a time to put things to right, be able to have conversations with your children or amongst the family to be able to understand what's important to her. And um, maybe what was important to her wasn't what Frank was always saying was important. Maybe he was the spokesperson, and now she gets a chance to yeah. say, how do you mm -hmm. want the rest to go? And, and are there are there sorries to say, or I love yous, things that haven't been said? Are there sorries to say? Yeah, like, I'm sorry, you know, I did my best, or I'm sorry I wasn't present for you. Things that are important to be able to help her close her life in a, in a way that's um, peaceful for her, to be able to have a good death, whatever that could mean. Right. And, and, and by the way, going back to, you had said, if she has an end of life diagnosis, I just, that doesn't mean a diagnosis that means she's dead tomorrow. Right. This mm -hmm. means that there's this, this there's She'll a linger. path that she needs to be following. Right. Right. Which right. could be a long path. Because when, when people hear those words, people hear end of life, people hear hospice, it's especially, right? We talk about hospice. Right. Inevitably, it's like for two days. They get, you know, end, they end up the the hospice ends up being this irrelevance, although it is a a, a, a benefit that can truly benefit people, like for. Right long periods. Right, exactly, because there's more of a team who are involved, and I think uh, that team really helped the family to be able to have, you know, maybe to encourage conversations yeah. or to be able to spell them, to teach them. What, what, what happens? What's going to happen next? Sometimes it says, how long do we have, you know, to be able to understand how to put their lives in order. And hopefully, if she gets a real year, and we only know that when you look back, that you say, oh, we had a year, right. and we, but we didn't exactly know when that started. Right. You know, to be able to know that there are going to be times it's okay for them to not be able to be supportive and helpful, and we have time to start to build up services. Um, or is it fast? Is something going to happen quickly? And hopefully that's the conversation that happens with the physician. And palliative care is beautiful because it helps with that transition, moving from that acute treatment time to what comes next. And, 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 it, and it, helps you it helps you figure that out. Right. And, and, by and the to way, name it. One of the things I, I, I'm constantly trying to emphasize with clients is, you know, chances are you're going to have that kind of glide path because you are going to kind of know well ahead if, if, if death is coming. That's right. not like what it used to be. Now, right. in my family, we just had one of those where it used to be. I was at, where I was at, at, at we, had a, we have a regular meal of family members, right? And my, one of my wife's sisters cooks, and we go to her, their house, and it's her and her sister and her other sister, and the husband's, mm -hmm. she's one sister who's dead, the husband's there, and two weeks ago we were there. And then last Wednesday, he dropped dead. Okay. Just dropped dead, in the car, you know, with actually one of the other sisters, right? Right. Massive heart attack. I'm going to the wake this afternoon. Oh, he's, he's, goodness. he's being buried tomorrow. So, but but I think, f folks, many of my clients think that's how it's going to happen, and everybody wishes that to happen, you know. But it, it just seldom happens that way anymore, mm -hmm. which is why 
I think right. it's important that we, we're having these kinds of conversations. Well, we think you know. that's what we want, and I think that in many ways we'd like to go, you know, quote, in our sleep. But I think the... So, so not knowing if that's going to happen to any of us at any moment. So we may be in the last year of our lives, all of and us, we don't right know. now. And we don't well. know. And we don't know. That's right. You don't know. <laughs> but we have meetings. That's right. <laughs> I've got Important stuff to do. Important places like, to be. Like things exactly. to do. That's right. Which that's is right. the best way, I think, when you and I have had conversations about this, try to make all your years your best years. You know, yeah. don't let things lie untended. You know, make sure you're um, available to each other and that you express what you want to express. And hopefully those are positive um, conversations. But, yeah. you know, because we don't know. So if your brother-in-law maybe lived his life well, maybe he didn't have anything. He'd said it all. He said what he needed to say. We don't know that, but they just in him. case, we should all be... Have the opportunity You'd to, have the to opportunity. do right. 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 Now, do you have folks coming in to the Senior Center who, who kind of bring these kinds of problems with them, who are really concerned about this? Our, our outreach or deals with, yeah, our outreach department really deals with all of that. And, and I know that they are in touch with people like uh -huh. Rebecca and people who can help give them that support, whether it is in-home assistance or whether it is, you know, a little bit more advanced than that. Um, they make their decisions, but we can give them options. And, and right. I, I guess many people don't appreciate that, that you've got people right there Right. And that's their job, which, which means not only is it their job, they're going to be there for you, but because it's their job, they've got this kind of experience. They have right. a wealth of experience. You know? and, and they're good at it. I mean, they, they really are able to give the information. They're able to, to sit down and talk to the people. And they've done it for so long that I, you know, I trust their, their ability to, to put you in the right direction. Right, just to put you in the right direction. Well, it's where your community is taking care of you. You know, the, the, that adage that became popular, it takes a village. Well, this is, you know, your senior center, that's an assembly of people who care about their neighbors. And and they want to just do what's best for each other. So that's the perfect place. It's the center. Right. And I suppose it's an interesting way of putting it because it's not only the employees who are there, it's like the regular, it really has become a community. You yeah. can feel it when you walk into your senior center. It absolutely. It, re it really is a community. I, I, was, I was recently, I was reading this wonderful book that I've, I think I mentioned to both of you called The, the Art of Dying Well. I, was, I found myself reading it once, one night in bed, and my wife was like, well, that's pretty depressing. You know, but, <laughs> but it was this fascinating book just talking about folks who, as they, as, not, not in the very early stages, kind of how to think about the future, and then in later stages. But in the very first chapter, this woman emphasizes, you know, you need a tribe. You need a group of people around you right. who for want of a better term, who, you know, that you've contributed to the favor bank, that you've helped right. them and that you're right. close to them and stuff. And so people who will be there for you, because a lot of the, those, that system, when, when we were growing up, it was just kind of automatic. It was the family. Right. It was the family right. or it was the parish. Right. And you had these like local groups. But those kind of don't exist now. Well, and, and I think that's where the senior center does have that. I mean, we, we, People come, they come for meals, they come for activities, and they have friendships that, that have developed and grown. And I think, you know, you want that, and, and you want to know that you have a place to go to to ask the questions, when the tough questions, when you need to. And, and we're both of those things. Right. And, and I think especially for men. I mean, one of the things that was mentioned yeah. by this woman, Katie Butler, in the book was that while women historically, at least in the, those, these age ranges, had more kinds of communities of folks, right? The men just went to work. And there were communities mm -hmm. at work, and then they retired, and often those never got replaced by anything. Right. Yeah. And so when I see, well, I'm often there, and I'll see, for example, your incredible veterans group. <laughs> Breakfast, yep. That, how, how many people do you get to that? It's a huge event. I want to say between 30 and 40 people generally, on average, Re get regularly. there. Regular. And then we, we have a pool room, which is a big, yeah. Uh, draw for a lot of men um, and those have started to form groups I know that they keep an eye on each other and are just that connection as well um, but you're right predominantly I think you see a lot of women who make those connections more easily but that's but, a point but we're starting to see it more with the men and they keep an eye on each other they do and, yeah, and they that's do. And, and that's, that's the, the key. community and that's right. the key well, I, I really want to thank you for coming on. Sure. I want to thank you ahead of time for being willing to be at the, the seminar. Yes, definitely. Um, and we're going to be back shortly with uh, Dr. Anthony Wilson, uh, who's going to talk about palliative care. But once again, you ought, to come to the, you ought to come to this. You ought to be thinking about these things. These are really, it's never too early to be having these kinds of conversations. Right. Right. And you're not alone in this. You shouldn't be just retreating into your own, you know, 
don't assume that your kids know all of this. Mm -hmm. They haven't dealt with these things before either. Right. You need to reach out. So thank you. We'll be right back. Thank you. Are you worried about letting your child take the wheel? Maybe you should also be worried about what you're doing behind the wheel. Have you ever sent a quick text just this once? Well, that might turn into a catastrophic accident. Monkeys see what monkey do. If you do it, why wouldn't your child? In a child's brain, almost all things their parents do, they can do too. 78% of teen drivers' surveys text and drive. 59% said their parents do it too. Stop texting and driving, because if you do it, your child will too. So welcome back to this show, which I think uh, or hope um, will be helpful to you, a show that Amy Beck and I had talked about doing to f help people focus on what they need to be doing and should be thinking about in the last year of their lives. Our second guest is a really wonderful doctor named Anthony Wilson. Doctor, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. Who spends a lot of his time uh, at Milford Regional, where, where you've been now for, for a while? Yes. Right? I've been there since 2006, actually. Until 2006. Wow. Uh -huh. But you actually, during that time, really developed this, this specialty, which you really wanted to focus on. Yes. So, and, so mean, can you just talk about kind of the, 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 the nature of the work, the nature okay. of what you're doing, how it relates to what other folks are doing at the hospital, and then how it re would relate to my friend Mary, you know, yeah. who, was, who was older, looking at the last year of her life, and, and through any, for any number of reasons, right? What should, what should she be thinking about and what should she be talking to you about? Yes. How's that? Um, very good. Uh, palliative care is, uh, is an area that has a name now that didn't previously have a name, but we were still doing it many years ago where you talk about what's important to you. You talk about your quality of life, and you talk about um, how things would be if you could choose them to be in that last year of your life. Yeah. Um, and everybody is different, and a lot of times, unfortunately, we get paternalistic in medicine, and we kind of tell people what to do instead of asking them what's most important to them, especially each step along the path. As you mentioned, a lot of times people have a lot of different medical problems and a lot of different medical issues, and sometimes it's really hard to know if you're in that last year of your life. But what's most important is what's most important to you in regards to quality of life. Is it okay to keep on coming back and forth to the hospital sometimes five or six or ten times in a year? Um, is it okay to be doing all those procedures, some of which hurt and are uncomfortable, and may not in the long run get you what you're really looking for? I and remember hear, hearing a doctor refer to a term called a dwindles. Mm -hmm. The point at which you fix one thing, something else breaks. Yeah. You fix something, and, and so you're just at that point in life, and you're saying to yourself, is, the, is, the, is my goal to be constantly being repaired? knowing that maybe it's going to break, you know, that's, yeah. that's hard. So you walk the, the line between the, the doing the procedures and yet looking at the mental health, where a person is, where they are, want to be as far as what's for the, what they want to do next, not so much yeah. just the physical part. Right, and it's at any stage of an illness. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we do in the field of palliative care is to sit down and talk with, all the different specialists. You may have a cardiologist or a lung specialist or an oncologist and, um, and or learn. All the above. Or all the above. All the above. <laughs> right. And learn what all the other options are that are available to you. And sometimes when you have advanced illness, um, those options become more and more limited and more and more risky. And the importance of balancing right. the pros and the cons of various different interventions. And a lot of times people are not told or they don't talk about, well, what happens if I get sicker and sicker or if these things don't work, then at what point is it really impacting my quality of life? Right. And that's what we try to get the whole family or support system of the patient involved to sit down and talk about you know, what's being offered to them medically. And sometimes people don't want to place any limits 
on treatments or interventions. Mm -hmm. But it's really important to know when there are certain things that are just too painful, too uncomfortable, or are not going in the way that you would want them to go, and you'd want that direction to be changed. So how, how do you... How do you deal with the family dynamics in that case? Because you know, certainly you, you see it a lot more than I do, but I see it, right? You see mm -hmm. the, yeah. the people being pulled, especially as a senior, you're being kind of pulled in, in, often in different directions by different children, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you talk about that a little bit and, and also talk about how you deal with these same kinds of questions where all these problems are happening, but the person's got dementia. Yeah. But Mary really has very little idea of kind of what's going on. Yeah. How, do you, how do you figure those things out, mm -hmm. right? Well, the most important thing that we should all be doing well in advance is establishing something that we call a healthcare proxy. Mm -hmm. That is that person who understands our deepest feelings about care and treatment and what we would want to go through if we weren't able to speak for ourselves and to have that person there as your advocate. Uh, a lot of times when you're under a lot of distress, um, Various different family members don't always have the same view that you might have, and a lot of different people are putting their input into what may or may not happen to you. And it's really so important to sort of establish somebody who will always be on your side to honor your wishes. And it's really nice when the whole family can come together and do that. And so we typically try to get the whole family there or to educate the whole family to know, you know, why you might not want to do something and what are the medical implications of, say, undergoing a cardiac bypass um, when you have kidney failure and when you have lung disease and, you know, what's that going to get you when one child might be saying, yeah, mom, you've got to do everything and she's knowing that it's gonna be a long road of rehab, a long road of being in the hospital, m multiple complications may come up, and that's not how she would wanna spend her last uh, days or, or year right. in hospitals and in rehab. Well, and I think that's important. I mean, people need to have those conversations. You have it with one person in the family, but you, know, you have to have it with all of them. Um, one may be ma the person making that decision, but make sure that the others know, because mm -hmm. otherwise the person left as your proxy is now having to explain, no, this is really what they want, and they don't have a clue. That's so those, those are conversations that need to be had with everybody. That's an excellent point. And, and, it, and it goes also to the, to the doctor's point that it isn't about, it is certainly about having a healthcare proxy. You, mm -hmm. you want to know, you want to have somebody that the doctor can turn to if, if you can't make the decision on, if the doctor decides right. you really can't make the decision on your own. But you also have to have the conversation with those people. Mm -hmm. I, I regularly get, you know, I, I was talking to a to a a, um, a, um, a, a woman who's a nurse in at, in Nantucket at the hospital, and she said, you know, people will come in and will call the proxy because there are these issues. About twenty percent of them don't even know they're the proxy. Right. Right. You know, you gotta it, this this you have, but you have to not only tell, but to, to give them a sense of what's important to your li in your life of what's important in your life. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny, people think about that just being as you age, it's as, at any point, if you, you know, whether it's a spouse or whatever, when you're younger, it's good to have that for the very reason that someone mm -hmm. knows and then other people should be informed for that very reason so that they know exactly where you want. And, and so it's not just an end of life thing. This is something right. that should be done at any point. So, so during that, yes, absolutely. So during that year, that are you, do you find yourself talking to these folks regularly? Or how do how does your conversations with them relate to those conversations that they were, they were having with that bevy of other players, the oncologists and the, neuro, the, neuro, the other players? Yeah. How does that work? And it's so hard because who knows when the end of their life is gonna be. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge not only for patients, but even for physicians. Um, and it's also very stressful for doctors having to talk to patients about the end of life. Um, and we are trained to not focus on that, but focus on doing whatever it is, the next step, the next step, the next intervention or medication that will extend your life. And sometimes we're extending it in a way that 
you would not prefer for it to be extended. So it's really, um, it's really important to um, be able to have these conversations um, and get a general understanding about what's really important to you and to try to do everything to improve your quality of life. But, but um, sometimes we see that people are coming back to the hospital a lot or they're having like multiple different surgeries um, or they're having markedly exacerbating pain. And, um, and sometimes when you come into the hospital and you have severe pain, well, we're gonna hold off on the pain medication if your blood pressure's low or if you're unstable in other ways, if your heart's unstable. And sometimes it's really important to know, okay, this pain control is more important to me than everything else. <laughs> an excellent point, an excellent point. Now, now do, you, do you find, that must make for some interesting conversations though among all you doctors. Do, do you find, you've been in the profession now for mm -hmm. a while, that, 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 well, I'll call the cure doctors, right, are more sympathetic to this position now than they were? Or do you think that they always were? Because that, that, there must be some push and pull there sometimes. There's more and more awareness every day, I find, of, um, especially with the, the younger ones <laughs> that are coming through residency yeah. and, you know, joining our hospital and, um, to to think about uh, when things are um, becoming more challenging for patients or when patients are saying no to a lot of things that are being offered to them, to take a step back and say, okay, let's look at the forest mm -hmm. because um, there's a lot of things that this patient is saying no to or is unhappy about or is... Um, distressed about or they're having a lot of symptoms let's figure out with his family where he wants to go and what he wants to do what's the right direction so so this is an ad <laughs> as I say you should be coming to the seminar we're, and we're going to be talking more about this I think in, in over, over the course of even the next year this whole notion of having conversations with the people that you love getting this stuff right is a crucial piece of what they're doing at the senior center, mm -hmm. you know. And, and doctor, I can't, I can't thank you enough for coming, and I'm glad that you're going to be participating with us in the uh, seminar. Thank, thank you very you. much. You're welcome. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> uh, I hope you enjoyed this, and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next installment of Frank and Mary here in Hopkinton. Thank you.